good afternoon, everyone. I am here with the Illinois Department of Public Health Director, Dr. Ngazi Azike, to provide an update on Illinois' progress vaccinating the public, as well as our gradual path back to normalcy as we work to bring this pandemic to an end. Dr. Azike and I are joined today by Dr. Rodney Alford, a pediatric and internal medicine specialist and an Illinois State Medical Society trustee. Dr. Paul Peterson, the Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at OSF St. Joseph Medical Center in Bloomington. Dr. Whitney Lynn, who works at the Sengstack Clinic at Cook County Health's Provident Hospital. And Deborah Murphy, a child, a home child care provider and a member of SEIU Healthcare Illinois. Because of our state's incredible workforce of healthcare professionals and our exemplary National Guard, Illinois is continuing to run ahead of the national average for vaccinations. 60% of our adult residents have already received at least a first dose. That includes 85% of our Illinois residents, 65 and over. Most of those millions of shots took place at mass vaccination sites, at local health department clinics, at pharmacies, and at hospitals. These shots largely went to people who were immediately eager to get vaccinated. Many refreshed pharmacy websites, many called on behalf of their elderly relatives, or drove to another county nearby, or even much further. The days of vaccine scarcity are over. Today, we are in a new phase of our vaccine administration plan of meeting people where they are and making sure that they get their shots, perhaps at their doctor's offices. So today, we're initiating the expansion of vaccine administration to physicians' offices across the state of Illinois, allowing them to become COVID-19 vaccine providers for their patients right there uh, and right there in their own doctor's offices. Already, as of this afternoon, over a thousand offices have signed up to do this, and I'm encouraging all interested providers to do the same. We have the vaccine, all we need is the doctors. Dr. Zike will talk more about how physicians can sign up to distribute and the physician leaders joining us today will, of course, echo this call. This is about making it as easy as possible for those who have not yet gotten vaccinated to protect themselves from COVID-19. For some people, that's a matter of comfort. They'd rather get a vaccine from a doctor they know and trust. For others, it's about convenience. If you're already visiting a healthcare provider for another treatment or checkup, it's easier to get vaccinated on the spot rather than having to make a second extra trip. Whatever the reason, Illinois is doing everything that we can to make this vaccine as easy and accessible as possible for all who want it. This call also applies to pediatric offices. Already dozens have signed up to be prepped and ready for when vaccines become available to young people ages 12 to 15 perhaps as early as next week. And we encourage every provider that we can offer vaccination, vaccinations to, to do so. Please sign up. For doctors, this is not only a great way to educate and vaccinate your patients, it's also an opportunity to offer the vaccine to their family members as well. I also wanna provide an update today on the next phase of our COVID-19 public health mitigations. Each day, people in Illinois and across the nation are still getting sick and being admitted to the hospital with this deadly virus. And each day, our doctors and our nurses and our healthcare professionals do everything in their power to save every life that they can, one patient at a time. But the light that we can see at the end of the tunnel is getting brighter and brighter as more people get vaccinated. As a testament to the life-saving, community-protecting power of vaccinations, I'm pleased to announce this morning that the, con the concerning upward movement of cases and hospitalizations that we were seeing a few weeks ago have stabilized. The number of people going into the hospital each day with COVID-19 
has dropped. The total number of patients fighting COVID-19 in the hospital is beginning to level off. And our statewide ICU bed availability is above 20%. As a result, on Friday, May 14th, the state of Illinois will move into the bridge phase of our mitigation plan, one step closer to removing nearly all of the remaining mitigations. For restaurants and bars and retail and weddings and public gatherings, this means higher capacity limits and a very hopeful move toward full reopening. And barring any significant reversals in key COVID-19 statewide indicators, Illinois will move to phase five, normal business operations free of pandemic-related mitigations as soon as Friday, June 11th. Whenever we reach phase five, we will continue to follow CDC guidelines on masking to keep this pandemic at bay. This good news comes with a caveat. We have all seen throughout this pandemic that this virus and its variants have proven to be unpredictable. Metrics that look strong today are far from a guarantee of how things will look a week, two weeks, a month from now. We saw that last August and again last March. But what we do know is that we have tools in our arsenal like vaccinations and wearing masks that, if we all use them, have proven extremely effective. I want to thank people across Illinois who are continuing to do their part to make your friends and your family safer and your communities healthier. Folks, this pandemic is not over. But if we're going to truly end it, we have to make sure that we don't see another surge in the virus. And the best way to do that is for everyone to get vaccinated. Already, millions of Illinoisans have done their part to get protected and help our state. But we need millions more to get vaccinated. And the best time to do that is now. If you haven't gotten vaccinated, we can help you find a shot near you. Visit coronavirus.illinois.gov, check Walgreens or CVS or Juul or your local pharmacy, or just call our vaccine hotline at 833-621-1284. If you don't wanna make an appointment, you don't need to. You can visit one of our Illinois National Guard mass vaccination sites, all of which are now taking walk-ins. And if you're a pastor or a lay leader of a religious group or you're head of a community organization or a mutual aid society or a neighborhood association, you can host a vaccination clinic for your community and we will provide the resources and the staff. You can sign up at dph.illinois.gov slash COVID-19 slash vaccination clinics, or just go to the DPH website online and you'll be able to find vaccination clinics. Or you can call IDPH at the vaccine hotline at 833-621-1284. And if you can, talk to someone in your life about why you got vaccinated and then help them do the same. We'll get through this the same way that we've been able to get through this from the very beginning helping each other and working together. Thank you, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to our state's top doctor, Dr. Ngazi Azike. Doctor? Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon and happy Thursday. As you've heard the governor said, uh, we have, we've hung in there and we've done what we can and we are moving in the right direction. The number of cases is decreasing and the number of people getting vaccinated is increasing. So that's a great recipe. I'm so pleased to report that over 60% of the adult population in Illinois has received at least that first dose. And as we might expect or anticipate, we're starting to see a bit of a slowdown in the daily number of people getting vaccinated. So now our focus is directly on the steps that we can take to get shots into the arms of those people who have not yet been vaccinated. As the governor mentioned, smaller providers like your family doctor, your pediatrician, they are now eligible to order COVID-19 vaccines directly from iCare, our state immunization registry. So we're encouraging providers who have not already enrolled in iCare 
to do so and to help make the vaccine <clears throat> excuse me, and to help make the vaccine as accessible as possible for every single Illinoisan. We know that when it comes to our health, the person that we tend to trust the most is our own personal physician. Any provider can go to the IDPH website and search for the Eye Care Access Enrollment Packet to sign up. The enrollment and approval process will take about one to two weeks, and then after that, providers will be able to administer COVID-19 vaccines to their patients in their offices. We know that there are some logistical challenges with the vaccine, namely the ultra-cold storage requirements and the number of vials that are typically shipped to a provider, but we're working with that. We're going to work with hospitals and healthcare organizations to identify ways in which smaller doctors' offices can work with one another and share the doses so that even a provider who may only administer a dozen or two dozen doses a week can still have access to this valuable resource. We will not waste any opportunity to get someone vaccinated because we know that this vaccine is a lifesaver. IDPH has been reaching out to pediatricians and encouraging them to enroll to become a provider. In anticipation of authorization of COVID-19 vaccine for youth 12 to 15, could come as soon as next week. Vaccination is how we'll have peace of mind as we send our youngsters to summer camps, uh, youth sports, and all those activities that make summer in, Il in Illinois so memorable. We want to keep moving forward and to do that, we need to get more and more individuals vaccinated. And we're working to make the vaccines available in as many locations as possible. We have mobile vaccination teams who have set up vaccination clinics at churches and at grocery stores. And like the governor said, any organization can request a mobile vaccination team to host a community partner vaccination clinic. And so that information is on the website and you can sign up uh, to apply for your site. Vaccination is not the same as a vaccine. IDPH has been trusted with vaccines, but each of you make the vaccines turn into a vaccination. And so that's why we need everyone's help. If you've already turned a vaccine into a vaccination, congratulations, and I'm so glad that you are protected. Now I need each of you who have already taken that step to talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to your coworkers about making that same leap. Research shows that healthcare providers, as well as friends and families, those are the people that you look to when deciding to get vaccinated. So tell your story, tell why you got vaccinated, and then get 10 other people to do the same. If you have that friend that says, you, you know, I'm healthy, I don't really need the vaccine, let them know that the vaccine is not just about them. People need to be vaccinated so that the 10-year-old with asthma who lives next door and is too young to get vaccinated can also enjoy that protection so that the immunocompromised adult neighbor whose immune system won't react to the vaccine and offer them protection, that you're trying to protect that person as well. Summer is coming. Let's take the necessary steps now so that we can enjoy this summer as it arrives. Wear your mask and get your shot. And I know it's a little early, uh, but you know, whether you're celebrating yourself, whether you're being celebrated, celebrating your mom, or celebrating the memory of a dearly departed mom, I want to wish everyone a beautiful uh, Mother's Day weekend. And now I will summarize comments in Spanish. Buenas tardes a todos. Seguimos avanzando en la dirección correcta. El número de casos está bajando y el número de personas que se vacunan sigue aumentando. A medida que superamos el 60% de la población adulta que recibe al menos una primera dosis, comenzamos a ver bajar la cantidad de personas que se vacunan todos los días. Ahora nos estamos enfocando en qué podemos hacer para poner las vacunas en los brazos de la gente que no se han vacunado. Como mencionó el gobernador, Proveedores como su doctor ahora son elegibles para solicitar la vacuna COVID-19 directamente de iCare, el registro de inmunizaciones. Insto a los proveedores que no se han inscrito en iCare que lo hagan 
y ayuden a que la vacuna sea lo más accesible posible para todos los residentes de Illinois. Sabemos que cuando se trata de nuestra salud, la persona en la que más confiamos es nuestro propio doctor. Cualquier proveedor puede ir al sitio web de IDPH y buscar el paquete de inscripción de acceso a iCare para inscribirse. El proceso de inscripción y aprobación dura entre una o dos semanas. Pero después de eso, los proveedores podrán administrar las vacunas COVID-19 a sus pacientes. No queremos perder ninguna oportunidad de vacunar a más gente de Illinois. La vacunación es la forma en que podemos volver a los campamentos de verano y los deportes para jóvenes. Para avanzar, necesitamos que más personas se vacunen. Estamos trabajando para que la vacuna esté disponible en tantos lugares como sea posible. Hemos lanzado equipos de vacunación móviles que han establecido clínicas de vacunación en iglesias y supermercados y otros lugares. Cualquier organización puede solicitar un equipo de vacunación móvil para organizar una clínica de vacunación para la comunidad. Esa información también se encuentra en el sitio web de IDPH. La vacunación no es algo que el Departamento de Salud Pública en Illinois puede hacer solo. Necesitamos ayuda de todos. Si ha sido vacunado, gracias. Pero también hable con sus amigos y compañeros de trabajo, de trabajo sobre cómo vacunarse. Si tiene ese amigo que dice que está sano y que realmente no necesita la vacuna, hágale saber que la vacunación es más que solo para ellos. Las personas deben vacunarse para proteger a ese niño de 10 años con asma que vive al final de la calle y es demasiado joven para vacunarse. Finalmente, si quieren tener sus carnes asadas, las quinceñeras y bautismos sin dudas de infectar a su abuela o su mamá, vacunate hoy para disfrutar tu, tu verano, porque ya me vacuné y tengo gran planes para estar este verano. Desea Deseo un feliz 10 de mayo a todas las mamás in Illinois. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Rodney Alford from Iroquois Memorial Hospital. Thank you, Governor Pritzker and Dr. Ezeke, my hero. I'm encouraged that we appear to be turning a corner on our battle against COVID-19 pandemic. To win the fight, we simply must get more people vaccinated. With increased access to vaccines, it's an achievable goal. The Illinois State Medical Society is pleased that vaccines will now be available to more physician offices. Hopefully more people will get vaccinated when they visit their doctor for routine care. I'm here to encourage everyone to get vaccinated, but I would add a special plea to Illinois' black and brown communities to get the COVID-19 vaccine. We're currently under vaccinated as compared to the rest of the state's population. To return to normal, we must make sure that vaccine is widely available and in use. When they conducted the clinical trials on all three of the primary vaccines, they included diverse racial populations in their testing to ensure safety. So these drugs are safe. We are now more than five months in vaccination with almost 10 million shots given in Illinois alone. There's a track record here, proving that these vaccines are safe. Again, 10 million shots just in Illinois. I've been vaccinated, my family's been vaccinated. The vaccine is safe. I wouldn't have taken it myself if it weren't, and I surely would not have given it to my family. If you're still unsure, please talk to your doctor or your health professional. If you are young and healthy 
and don't have a regular doctor, you should get vaccinated to ensure that you are keeping your family safe. As we are exiting the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now entering the pandemic of misinformation and incomplete information, which may usher in a new COVID-22 pandemic. By the end of this year, we will have four populations of people, in my belief. One, those that get COVID-19, get sick, or die. Two, those that get COVID-19 and later on get the vaccine. Third group of people are those that refuse the vaccine but live in fear or in denial with or without a mask. And the fourth group of people are those that get the vaccine or have already had the vaccine and have confidence and freedom from fear of the virus and free of mask wearing. I choose freedom. I choose health. I choose life. I myself belong to that community that has vaccine hesitancy. I belong to the black and brown community. I belong to the conservative Christian community. I belong to the urban community. I now live in the rural community, but I am not hesitant to live without fear. I am truly free. Defeating this pandemic of vaccine resistance and hesitancy is a matter of education and trust. You might want to believe and trust the internet or other media accounts or media outlets, or you might want to trust me, your doctor. I'm a black physician born in Chicago in the projects of Altgeld Gardens, trained at Loyola University's medical school in Chicago, and now practicing medicine for over 35 years first at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, then to Pembroke Township in Kankakee County, and presently in central Illinois, Iroquois County in the city of Watsika. You decide who you want to trust. Black and brown communities, I say NTV. We need to take the vaccines. NTV. Necesitamos tomar los vacunas. N T V N T V. Thank you. Dr. Whitney Lynn from Cook County Hospital is going to come up here from uh, attending physician, family medicine uh, at Cook County Hospital. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Whitney Lynn a family medicine physician at Cook County Health. Thank you to Governor Pritzker and the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians for inviting me here today to discuss vaccine, vaccination efforts in our primary care clinics and the impeding expansion of vaccinations for adolescents. As a physician at one of the largest health systems in the country, I have seen firsthand the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on our families and our children. This is especially true in black and brown families who are born a particularly heavy burden from this deadly disease. I am excited that as a family medicine physicians, we are expanding the number of physicians and practices who are able to distribute the vaccine. This is incredibly important as family medicine doctors have built relationships with the families they care for, sometimes over generations. And with those relationships, there comes a sense of trust. As we hopefully soon will be expanding vaccine, vaccine access to 12 and 15 year old parents, grandparents and guardians should feel comfortable talking to their doctor's offices about the vaccines. They will be able to address your concerns best because they know you. Getting everyone who is eligible the opportunity to be vaccinated is critical as we look forward to the summer and that includes our young people. Cook County Health has administered more than 700,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines, and we are looking forward to offering the Pfizer vaccine to children ages 15 and up as soon as the approved FDA and by the CDC. There are many reasons why adolescents should be getting vaccinated. Younger people are generally less likely to experience severe COVID symptoms, but serious illness, illnesses in kids still happens. And even if you don't feel sick, 
children and adolescents are able to spread the disease to others, putting vulnerable people at risk, particularly in multi-generational households. And the more people we get vaccinated, the better chance we have to safely return to normalcy. Returning to normalcy is so critically important. Along with physicians from around the country, I have seen the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on the mental, physical, and social health of our younger patients. We've seen increased instances of depression and anxiety. And we know that because children have been unable to get the social services, have been unable to, I'm sorry, because schools have not been open to open safely, they are missing some developmental milestones. The science behind the vaccine is strong, and I hope we will continue together to vaccinate the residents of Illinois and provide guidance to those who are hesitant when needed. As this will be ongoing, we strongly believe that incorporating primary care physicians and practices into vaccination plans with effective coordination and communication will advance our shared goal, ensuring maximum and equitable access to all vaccines. Thank you. Please welcome Deborah Murphy. Thank you, Governor Purser and Dr. Ezekiel for having me. My name is Deborah Murphy. I am a home child care provider from Chicago, Illinois. I've been in child care for over 36 years. When I first started, I did it because I love children. And there were single moms in my neighborhood who needed a haven for their kids. I've always believed that it takes a village to raise a child. And that is why I have chosen to stay in this field after so many years. A few months ago, when the vaccines began to roll out, I was hesitant to sign up. This hesitation was for a few reasons. The first being that I don't like taking shots. I never have. I was also fearful because of all the misinformation circulating online among people in our communities. I knew that I needed to look to God, to my heart for the answer. I know how challenging it has been for many to not see or touch their families, fearing that somebody will get sick. I remember losing my favorite uncle to COVID, my father's brother, one of the first men I've ever loved. So I spoke to my primary care doctor, who affirmed what I felt in my heart was the right decision, to get vaccinated. She is someone who I trusted over the years to give me her honest medical opinions. Then I started seeing my colleagues in childcare and in my union get vaccinated. I saw people who I cared for putting their fears aside and coming out fine. So I listened to my heart. I put my faith in God and I got the shots. I know in our communities there is still some hesitation about getting vaccinated and I understand. What I also understand, however, is that the black community has been devastated by COVID. My uncle was one of too many loved ones lost to COVID in our world. Currently, I have five grandchildren, and my plan is to be here for my great-grandchildren. While I don't feel high risk, I know that I am, and that recovering from COVID would be far from easy for me. For me, the benefits of getting the vaccine far outweighs the risk of catching COVID and not being able to be there for my family. Now that the shots are being made available through the doctor's offices, it is easier than ever to get one. I want to urge anyone who loves themselves, their family, and community, leave the fear behind. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Put your faith in God, make your appointment, and get vaccinated. Thank you. Back to the governor. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to, uh, sorry, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Peterson. He's the VP and Chief Medical Officer at OSF St. Joseph Medical Center in Bloomington, Illinois. Doctor?
Doctor, I'm sorry, we're having trouble with the audio. My apologies. G give us one second. I'm not sure if you're on mute or we are. <coughs> We're having a technical difficulty here, doctor, so give us one more minute. Can you hear me now? We can, thank you very much. All right, start over if you would. I shall. <laughs> uh, thank you, Governor Pritzker and Dr. Azike, for this great opportunity to encourage all the residents of Illinois to get their COVID vaccinated. For more than 70 years, the Illinois State Medical Society has been working to improve medical access in rural Illinois. I've personally been active in addressing rural medical care access issues for more than 30 years. And now we are encouraging residents in downstate Illinois and our rural community to step up and get vaccinated. As the other speakers have said, vaccine hesitancy isn't so much about the science and the logic. It is about emotion, fear, and lack of trust. While agreeing with the science, we need to address fear and the lack of trust quietly, confidently, and with empathy for those who are hesitant. Among those competent to discuss this empathetically are our community physicians. We have a unique relationship with our patients and our communities to be able to help dispel the hesitancy. The good news, as you've heard, is that the vaccines are now becoming more accessible to our medical practices, which will make it even easier for you to get your shot at your doctor's office while you're there for another reason. Just get the COVID shot while you're there. If you're reluctant to get vaccinated or have concerns about the safety, please, please talk to your doctor. She or he will be able to provide information and education on the safety and the effectiveness of those vaccines. I've personally talked to those who are hesitant and your doctor, your doctor can talk with you about your concerns as well. Getting vaccinated is really, really important to protect not only you from this deadly virus, it's also important, as other speakers have said, to protect your family and to keep your local community safe. Please get vaccinated. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it back over to Governor Pritzker for Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, before I take questions, um, I want to talk about uh, another piece of good news that came this week. Our state revenues are outpacing the estimates and the expectations that experts gave us earlier this year. Our state and our economy have shown tremendous resilience while we have still far too many who are struggling, our collective economic and fiscal outlook is brighter than it was even three months ago. Back in February, when faced with financial uncertainty to the state and the prospect of billions of federal dollars going directly to our schools, I presented a flat operational budget for the state, which was all we could afford. Because our outlook has improved, I have informed legislative leaders that I am now in a position to propose increasing evidence-based funding for schools by $350 million. That means that parents, students, and educators can breathe a sigh of relief. As an education advocate myself, I am really all too happy that our improved economic and fiscal condition allows us to increase educational funding. This doesn't erase Illinois' structural budget problems, but I remain committed 
to finding long-term sustainable solutions that don't put the burden on working families who can least afford it. That's why I will continue to pursue closing corporate tax loopholes, corporate welfare that mostly benefits large international businesses that have profited greatly even during the pandemic. We are all in this together, and it's time that everyone stepped up to help us recover. So thank you, and with that, I'm happy to take questions from members of the media. Marianne. Thank you, Governor. What, with fully reopening, does that mean we remove the masks? Now, as I've said many times, that we're going to follow the CDC's recommendations with regard to masks, and uh, I believe that they are evaluating masks all the time, looking at ways that we might loosen up as things get better in the United States. So we're going to watch and listen to them, but. Uh, during this period, it's very important that people still wear masks when appropriate. As you know what those situations are, I won't re repeat them. Uh, but it's very uh, exciting to me that we can begin to reopen uh, to a bridge phase and then ultimately to um, phase five, which is reopening everything except making sure that we're still masking so we can protect those who are unvaccinated. Those who are unvaccinated can protect everyone else. Maybe. I'm just telling you that I'm going to listen to the doctors. The CDC are evaluating this constantly, as you know, and they've made adjustments even most recently uh, to ma masking outside, saying that if you're in a, a group outside, as long as it's not a big group and people are vaccinated, uh, or inside with a group of people that are vaccinated, you know, a small group, you can uh, go unmasked. And I do when I'm in a large group. I try to, you know, it's Look, uh, you know, I don't count heads when I walk into a place, but, but, uh, but the fact is, you know, you can tell when people are very close to one another, not wearing masks, or people are wearing masks. It's appropriate to wear one in a crowded space. But I have been outside with people who are unmasked and masked, but, you know, obviously being outdoors in a small group is safe. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Enrique. Yes. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask Dr. Ezeke to come up and talk. She's actually been leading a group all year uh, that is focused on making sure we're getting to all the communities. So, Dr. Ezeke, answer in Spanish. You better. Sí, uh, los, uh, los proveedores que, han, eh, que están inscritos por ICARE es de todas las comunidades del estado. Uh, yo puedo después uh, darle una, una lista de todos los condados, pero es uh, des, uh, a, a, a través del la, la estado entero. Uh, la otra pregunta es para las personas con altas habilidades. So, por, para ca, cua, uh, cada condado uh, tiene... Uh, algunas formas de, de ayudar con eso. Uh, muchos condados, el, el Departamento de, de Público de Salud tiene como listas de personas que necesita una persona para ir a una dirección para dar la vacuna. A veces es la, la condado, el público, el Departamento de Público del Condado, a veces es el uh, EMS, como el, uh, las personas con uh, em, la sistema de emergencia, uh, depende. Pero si, si uh, llama a la, a la condado, puede decirle cuál es la mejor uh, oportunidad para recibir vacunas para esas personas. Yes. Yes. We still have a moratorium on evictions in Illinois. That was not thrown out. Um, we are uh, looking to the significant federal funding that has now been made available for rental assistance and putting a program out there, as we did last fall, to help renters pay their landlords. The money goes directly to landlords. You just have to sign up online to be to for a renter to access 
those resources to pay their rent. Um, we'll be back up with that system uh, relatively soon and, uh, of course, uh, focus not only on that but also homeowners assistance. Well, we continue to adjust the number of National Guardsmen, for example, at our national, at, at, sorry, at our mass vac sites. Um, as, you know, they're needed, we want to make sure not to pull them out, but if they're not needed, uh, we want to uh, readjust and make them part of our mobile uh, efforts all across the state of Illinois. So the, the mass vac sites, you're not intending to... Well, we're... We're still seeing, you know, literally thousands of people are coming to our mass vac sites every week, and we don't want to take that away in communities where that's been extraordinarily important. Obviously, there may come a time when we've got, uh, you know, when we're reaching herd immunity or when, you know, fewer and fewer people are seeking vaccinations, but we want to make it very accessible to people. One of the things that's prohibited some people from getting vaccinate, vaccine is that it's not very nearby where they are, and, and that's why we've put all these sites all over the state uh, to try to make them more and more accessible. We don't want to take that away, especially as we're trying to get more and more people vaccinated who have had difficulty. Governor, have you heard from the mayor on all of this? Do you know if the city of Chicago will be following your guidelines? I know that the mayor has said July 4th is what she's aiming at. I'm sure that she's motivated to try to get there sooner. Uh, but this is where we can move to as a state. So now I want to ask you about House Bill 2789, which gives you or the IDPH control over not only public schools, but private schools and religious schools. And many parents are deeply concerned because they've been open since last August and there have been uh, not a high number of cases. And they say that it gives you too much power. If it comes to your desk, will you sign it? If so, why? Well, let's back up because I've seen some of this uh, uh, noise on Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, that bill has been adjusted significantly. You should go and look at the amended version of that bill. Um, but, uh, you know, look, the goal here is just to make it safe for kids in school. And uh, ultimately, you know, we need to make sure that schools have the ability to do that. And that's what that bill is really aimed at. So it's not, you should go back and look at some of the provisions that were originally of concern to people. And this happens to legislation all the time. It gets introduced and then there are adjustments that are made in amendments. So I think, you know, you'll find it's a different bill than it was uh, when people took it up and were complaining about it. So yes, sir. I have a, a question on behalf of my uh, colleague, Ben Bradley, who mm -hmm. reported last night that taxpayers gave $4 million to a convicted felon who defrauded municipal government in the past uh, for the temporary use of the German hospital in the early months of COVID. How do you defend having the state do business with a felon who has been barred by the state procurement control? Well, I guess I'd remind everybody that in the early days of the pandemic, you know, our job here was to make sure that we were, that we had the capacity available in hospitals uh, and in alternate care facilities if our hospitals filled up. Um, you know, emergency officials uh, associated with the state and the federal government helped us to identify locations that would be best for those alternative uh, care sites. Uh, and you saw some of them getting built out. Um, uh, that was a case, and, and in others, where we took the properties uh, and used them as we needed to to make sure that we weren't going to uh, overtax our healthcare professionals and our hospitals, and ultimately a court ruled that we needed to pay uh, for the use of those sites. We don't operate hospitals. Uh, the state of Illinois doesn't operate hospitals, so that's why. Craig, do you have a question? Because otherwise, we got to go online. Sorry. And for my sake in English, um, <laughs> based on you, you're obviously tracking the numbers every single day. Uh, you're putting out the caveats. You're encouraging people to, to carry their vaccinations. But how confident or what assurances do you think you can give the people of Illinois that we are going to hit the bridge phase as expected and that we can make it through phase five 28 days later? So I will just grab my crystal ball and tell you what it says <laughs> and with, with complete confidence. So what we do know, it, I mean, we know that COVID has thrown us a lot of curveballs, And so um, nothing is, is guaranteed, right? But we do know that there are trends that we have learned in terms of what patterns happen 
First, the test positivity goes up. After test positivity goes up, you get more cases. You get higher case rate. After that happens, you get more people admitted to the hospital with COVID. After that happens, the total number of people in the hospitals with COVID increases. After that, the deaths increase. So there is this pattern that we have seen with each of the waves and that other states that the country has seen. And so now, as we're seeing the test positivity go down, that signals that the other numbers will start to follow in that trend. And so as we have that happened, as also people who are susceptible to get sick decrease because they've been vaccinated, and as the most vulnerable have been overwhelmingly vaccinated, you know, we can project that we shouldn't see you know, a significant spike if the current circumstances, you know, remain the same. Um, so again, you know, I can't speak to the next variant of concern that wants to really just debunk everything I just said, but given what we know now, given what we know that our vaccines will do against the current variants of concerns and variants of interest, we believe that we will look good in terms of getting to the bridge. And again, fingers and toes crossed, we will also go on to the final phase five, you know, four weeks later. John O'Connor from the AP has a question for you, Governor. You've minimized the population decline, but it is a decline. In the past 20, 120 years, a decline in the state's population has only occurred about 40 times. Why are people coming, not coming to the state and what will you and the Democrats do to reverse that? So uh, I would, I think that's a, not a fair characterization. Uh, nobody is, is uh, minimizing um, the issue. I've talked about it for some time now and I'm trying to address it as governor. Uh, but what I was doing and pointing out was that for many years, the carnival barkers and the, you know, the right wing zealots uh, have been highlighting the uh, population decline and exaggerating it and talking about it as if it's inevitable. Um, and the fact is that as it turned out, we roughly had what we lost 0.1% of our population over the decade. That's not great, uh, but it's not what the carnival barkers were saying either. And I think pe people should just point out uh, and, and take notice that uh, Illinois did better than expected. So uh, having said that, over the last two years, we've been working very hard to reverse that, uh, to reverse any decline that, that we may have seen in, in the previous years of the decade. And how are we doing that? Focusing on the populations that we knew we could attract and the populations we knew we could keep. Uh, and then of course, you know, there were challenges all over the country during the Trump administration with immigration which is an important uh, additional portion of population that every state hopes to get. Uh, and you know, these are, are people who come from countries all over the world uh, seeking a better life. They're often the, um, you know, the greatest entrepreneurs uh, that join our, our state. Uh, and we want them to come here. And so we're, we're doing more to attract that population as well. Uh, so I, that's what I've been focused on. And, and you know, again, I, I'm not going to downplay it in any way. We have to do better. We have to do more. Uh, but the people who've blamed it on uh, things, you know, that, that are, uh, you know, uh, whatever, that are, you know, focused on their ideology um, are not focusing on the practical reality of what we need to do. We need to keep our students here. We need to make it more affordable for people to come to the state of Illinois and go to school here. That's hugely important to me. That's one big thing that I've done uh, as governor over the last two and a half years. Shia Politico, have you talked to Mayor Lightfoot about the elected school board bill and where do you stand on it in terms of hybrid versus all elected? She has not reached out about uh, that bill um, and uh, you know, I'm looking to see what the, I, you know, I'm in favor of an elected school board. I think that the uh, legislature and the people on both sides of whether we should have a hybrid or a fully elected board uh, have gotten together, it seems, to come to some compromise. You know, I welcome a compromise and certainly I'll be looking forward to what the legislature produces. Jake Griffin at the Daily Herald. Why the hesitancy to impose a vaccination requirement similar to what children need to attend school, and how long can we afford to wait to require it? I wouldn't call it necessarily hesitancy. I, look, I, I'm trying to listen to the best scientists about this, uh, watch what others are doing, uh, and uh, you know, and, and take note of what I think ultimately 
uh, the science says is best in, in this regard. So we don't even have an EUA related to 12 to 15 year olds, which we hope will come in a few weeks, but or uh, maybe even next week. But you know, let alone for younger ch school children. So we'll, we'll have we have time to make some decisions about all that, and also. Uh, as you know, we've been going to all of our colleges and universities, or many of them, across the state and offering vaccinations before people go home for the summer. Uh, and uh, there are other states where they're going to require uh, students to be uh, vaccinated before they come back to campus in the fall. You know, that's something we've looked at. I would like for, for you know, we'll see what percent of the population at schools uh, this spring show up to get vaccinated and over the summer and you know we'll have to be, make some decisions about that as well. Dan Petrella at the Tribune, why is it okay to move to bridge phase with deaths still increasing? So um, Dan, as you know, uh, uh, deaths are a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. And so as you, we had a, uh, a surge uh, in early March, an unexpected surge, and uh, as a result of that surge, when you look six and eight weeks later, which is about the time period Dr. Zike um, has been teaching me all year, uh, but you know, six to eight weeks after you get a surge, unfortunately, of cases, I mean, you see a surge in deaths. And so uh, that's why I, I don't disregard it. I mean, it, it, it pains me every day, frankly, to see those numbers and to think about the families that are affected. Uh, by those deaths, but we make decisions going forward based on as much leading indicator information as we can uh, rather than lagging indicator. Ryan Burrow, how do you anticipate the rollout of vaccines to children? Will there continue to be a focus on mass vaccination sites or is there a hope pediatricians will handle most of the vaccinations for kids? Is it believed that double doses of Moderna and Pfizer will still be needed for children? So I can't answer the question about whether double doses will be needed, although I, I am aware that uh, Pfizer, I believe, which is closest to having a 12 to 15 year old vaccine, vaccine it would be a two dose uh, vaccination. Having said that, um, certainly uh, kids going to school who already need to get vaccinated for other things and uh, have checkups and other health information that they need to provide to go to school uh, will be interacting with the healthcare system. And so, in that way, uh, interacting with their family physician or their healthcare provider will get them access to uh, doses uh, appropriately over the summer. Joel Ebert will be our last question. Uh, in your State of the State address, you said lawmakers need to prioritize energy legislation and ethics mm -hmm. reforms, yet there's been little progress on ethics reform so far. Why hasn't your office taken a more hands-on approach to ethics reform by introducing a bill like you did last week with the energy proposal? Well, you need to go back and look at what we proposed in our energy proposal, which had significant ethics reforms embedded in it. That was one of the reasons that we put out that bill, was to make sure that those ethics reforms were uh, an important part of energy legislation that gets passed. Um, I am, you know, optimistic that uh, the energy legislation that we put forward uh, I know is being debated, uh, considered, uh, has had some positive movement in the legislature, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get it uh, done before the end of the session in May. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.